Hello everybody, this is Brad Duck saying hi, how you doing? Uh, just reaching out to you to touch base. Um, we are in stage three now. We have gotten the hardware, we've gotten the compatibility done. Now we are doing the build out model without capacity, which means the one terabyte drives are not on board. This is strictly, completely uh, localized. So with that being said, um, we are working with bringing a cluster into state making sure it's current, compliant, and all that good stuff. Remember, since you're doing this for free, you don't you don't have the ability to doing updates. Uh, and then, of course, you want to bring in your first node and make sure that node works. And then we bring in a secondary node and so on and so on. So stand by for just a second here while I transition the display. Okay, so here we have the two principles that were built in my previous video. This is the cluster lead. In other words, it's the first one inside the cluster. And this is the one I flipped cluster state into. And this one is node number one. And these guys are operational. They have only received a 128 gig drive and 16, I'm sorry, correction. Uh, yeah, 16 gigs of RAMs each. So I've got some basic resources here. Remember, this is a small form factor. I'm being practical in my display. Now right here is node number two. Now I just finished installing the operating system, which we already went through, by the way. Check my other video. You know, we have the drive on board. It's got two 8 gig sticks on board and it's an i5 based platform. There is still no terabyte, one terabyte drive installation yet. I'll have to bring the cluster down to accomplish that, which will, by the way, sit in one of these. And at that point in stage, we will have our ability to um, get ourselves to bring into a cluster state. Now, when it finishes, the OS will reboot the machine, bypass the USB drive, and come into the boot prompt. And in this case, it's dot forty-seven colon eight zero zero six. So over here, I have both the cluster that I've already prepared, which is right here, and I have here my new individual single node. I'm going to go ahead and click log in and I'm going to go ahead and do a log in here as well. And again there is that wonderful statement saying you don't have support. And there is our little guy right there. Now at this point stage this node is compliant. It's checking correctly the summary statement, which you should always check your summary statements to make sure everything is good. It is showing present. It's showing capacity. All right, very good. So at that point in stage, we are able to go ahead and look at staging this node into the cluster. Now to do that, it's pretty simple. You go to your main cluster and you select data center up here at the top. And then you want to go and you want to get your your set here. Give me just a second. Okay, so you grab this guy right here, and this is called join information. You want to select this key and you want to close this out. Now here you show right there the cluster controller and the HT, the HTCL node 1. And I hit the join information, which provides me the join information ID information wrap, showing where the cluster is, the fingerprint, and the join key. Now, this cluster will be destroyed, so I don't have any problem showing this. But I'll show you how basically we do this. Now here, uh, we go over to the dot .47 and we're going to go to the data center value and we're going to go to cluster and I want to select join cluster. Now in here I need to paste that key. There is the key. Plus I have to provide the local password that I built for this unit. And this will give the proper access on both ends to allow this node number two to join node, node number one and the cluster pairing. Now there is one other issue about this that you have to consider and that is your true NAS shares. So if you're doing your NAS structures in a secure format 
you want to make sure that you're doing it in a format that allows you to give access to what is required, but at the same point in time, give your set values the appropriate IP addresses for matching. So to do that, you need to go in and you need to add the IP address of your individual shares into the system. And in this case, I'm going to go here and yes. And I'm going to edit. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going into the NTFS shares. And right there you see the IP addresses. And I'm going to select add and I'm going to put in the new IP address of this new unit, which is 1.47. And at that point in stage, I am good. And I'm going to hit apply. And I can then go back to the principal shares and do this again. And if you're asking the question, why am I doing such a restriction on the ACL, ACL being access control list, it's because I want to enable the sense of point-to-point -point share connectivity at the NTFS side, I'm sorry, at the NFS side, and also a, a, a availability of not having to do a lot of logging in. Um, so obviously, in my case, I am sharing this information with you in a pretest built on a single local switch, which is that little guy right over there. And uh, so there is no risk here to me because once I'm done with this project, this will be blown away. But normally we contain our ACLs and keep them confidential as best as possible. Now with that being done, I, it should be now finished. Let me confirm. Yeah, that's open scale. So that's just general connectivity. And then I can now go back to my dashboard on TrueNAS and I can return here. Now, the HTC CL Cluster Note 2 has basically done everything that is required. It does need time, but I can close this now. So I've closed that out. So now I'm back to the cluster, and there is Node 1, and there is Node 2, and there is the controller. And Node 1 has a VM instance on it, but it's currently offline. It's an Ubuntu server. And understand the naming convention ID is 100. It can be any sequence you want. It's just this is what comes up with Proxmox when you're doing this process. So what you've seen me do here is I have done a compatibility mode test. I have done a node introduction test twice now. And overall, this is running pretty smoothly. So what does that basically mean to me? Well, obviously, I don't can't do anything quite just yet. The reason why I can't do it just yet is because we're missing our one terabyte SSD footprint. Now this SSD footprint would go into place up on the SATA interface to provide us a repository for high performance 123s. But that's not all that's been done here. When you go into your cluster mode environment, one of the most important things you need to do is to go down to storage and understand that you're going to have two classifications. You have local LVM, which represents your, your basic connectivity, but you really can't use that one, particularly what, that one, because it is the 128 gig boot drive, and we're not going to touch that. But I'll be adding another one terabyte drive, that, which will become available uh, for the local VM style high performance, and I also have distributed as well, which is the VMs2 NFS disk. So backups, ISOs, if I select ISOs, for instance, I can add a value to that and its representation. Now, ISOs are strictly NFS shares that are specifically holding ISO images, nothing else. So what does that look like? Well, let's go over here to node one, right? And as we're in node one, we see right there ISOs. What's in that? Good question. I don't know. So select it. Select ISO images. And there they are. 
Now, if you establish the, N the NFS shares at the data center level, all nodes involved will be able to see this storage capacity across the board. So if I'm on node one and I want to go to my set for ISO, there it is. Node two, I can expand that out. Oh, and there it is again. So it's replicating and being, becoming available to all these different instances. Now, if I go to VMS two, I will discover that I've got VM disks out there. And those VM disks are basically my virtual machines, VM. And there's my Ubuntu platform right there, which belongs currently on node one. There it is, 100. But they all can see all of the same basic capacities. Backups are very important because they are a bit, give you the ability of snapshotting, pulling templates, and so on and so on so that you can very easily be able to quickly to redeploy, also have backups, also have a process of uh, retention in your equation. So this is an important detail. Now I have the true NAS capacity, which is this guy right here, and he's doing his magic wonders, right? And he is providing capacity. I've got about 20 terabytes of functional capacity. I've got SSD burst caching. I have all types of resources here. But in this particular case, we're just using, you know, 15,000 RPM SAS drives for my requirement. So when the time comes and I'm going to insert my one terabyte drive, this is a 128 gig drive. Uh, it cost me like $8. Um, this is great, by the way, for boot booting Linux environments. Great little drive, very supportive. It's got about three years of life on it in general. It works more than enough and it's cheap. But that right there is my 128 gig drive M2, M.2 standard. And But I would put in a large capacity drive in this slot here to give me the ability of having localized decent SSD performance VM function. But the good news is now I'm ready because I have my NFS VM disk storage as well, which means I can transition off these disks. I can empty all the VMs off this disk, put them out there. I might run a little slower because I only have a one gig architecture here, but I can do that, take the hard drive out, replace it, put another one in like a two terabyte and rock and roll. So with that being said, obviously I have to have one terabyte drive for each of these. As you can see over here, here's another one. And then over here's another one. And these give us the ability, the affordability actually, to be able to be really flexible. You can move things all over the place with these chassis. So that's pretty good. And again, look how small this is. That's right here. These three are the, is a functional set of clustering. Fully enterprise compliant, by the way. The only thing it's not compliant is the dual power supply requirements for connectivity and the dual NIC setup. But you can technically get around that by just simply bringing online the wireless network. I wouldn't do that though because wireless has its risks in general. But I do have the option. There's the antenna mount right there. So with that being said, this will give you the ability to be able to get a comfort level of building a cluster in Proxmox and just getting the standards down pat in regards to how you think it needs to go. Now remember I said, get a pencil and paper out, go to your application level, look at the requirements, how many instances do you need, build a Proxmox virtual machine environment to make those instances on the fly, back them up, make clones, make templates, deploy your application, it was slow, sluggish, blah, 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 go back, copy, pull of your templates, do it faster, cleaner, more efficient, and you start to get into the right habits when it comes to DevOps and how you bring continuous and contiguous style deployments on your code processes and do it on a shoestring budget and not uh, cook your room. But these could get a little warm. <laughs> anyway, so this is Brad Dyke signing off. I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you have a great week and God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.